What's up, everyone? Welcome into the All-22 NFL Podcast, the official podcast of the All-22 Fantasy Football Platform, the only fantasy football game with full 53-man rosters, including offensive linemen, where you get to choose personnel packages and have access to PFF grading and advanced stats to make decisions each week. To learn more, go to all-22.com or go visit the App Store for whatever type of phone you have because the app will be there and it's awesome. Ray, week five is in the books. Tell me, how are you feeling? So many injuries, <laughs> so many injuries. It's it's ridiculous. Uh, again, for a lot of non-high profile skill players too, which really hits at the heart of what we do here. So it's it's a shame when, uh, you know, you're like, oh, Michael Parsons is out for a few weeks. Let's see what uh, Marshawn Nealon can do. He's actually a pretty popular sleeper in, re in recent uh, rookie drafts, and he's been performing pretty well. And then he injures his knee, and it's just... I don't know, man. There's there's so many injuries. It's, it's it's very upsetting, but it's a sad reality of of the NFL halfway through the year, and it's made some waves with uh, the talk of the inevitable expansion to 18 games and wanting a second bye week, like we discussed a couple weeks ago. Uh, the issue is not going away, and it's 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 not going to go away. But uh, we do have a few years, obviously, till then with the CBA. But yeah, it was still great football. It always is great football. Tons of fun stuff to get to, and we're about a almost a third of the way through the season. Basically after this week, we'll be a third of the way through the regular season. So it, it goes quick. So cherish it. Dude. Uh, this might be people out there's first time experiencing what facing bye weeks in an all 22, you know, system uh, looks like. And it sucks sometimes, right? Like I, I had uh Lee McNeil out. Um, I had Micah Parsons that didn't play. Dexter Lawrence didn't play. Jeffrey Simmons didn't play, Javon Hargrave. Like, I lost so many games because all of a sudden it auto subbed in Brian Brisset for me. And it's just well, not all of a sudden well. that you set your depth chart because you still hold on to Brian Bressey for some he, reason. Even he was the bottom, he was the bottom guy. Like, that's that's where I'm at now. Just because bye weeks, injuries, it is a real thing, right? And some positions are going to get hard with it. So, um, he should be on the waiver wire. We've, we've, we've discussed this, Chris. We've discussed this. You're the fail fast guy and you're holding on to Brian Brissy. I don't understand. I like his story. You know, sometimes it's about the story. And I, I, I think know. there's redemption there to be had. Totally. Let's build a team of Rudy's. <laughs> Week five is in the book. Let's go through the positions. Let's talk about the season leader at quarterback, which is still Derek Carr, 88.0 <laughs> grade. And considering the, the state of his offensive line, it is actually pretty fantastic that he's able to hold on to that spot. But the top performer of the week was actually Baker Mayfield with a 90.7. Ray's going to say about how uh, they called me a madman and all this stuff. I don't. I honestly don't want to hear it again, so oh, okay. please stop. Uh, if, we should have, listen for time. <laughs> if we have to talk about something, let's talk about Caleb Williams, who we have talked about a bit on the show, but a 78.3 grade in uh, this week's game. And he led the Bears to another win, right? They are now, I think, three and two. NFC North is full of winners. Uh, you know, what are you thinking about Caleb Williams so far? Yeah, it's uh, it, this is the natural progression. Everybody gets blinded by the one case every year where someone is ahead of schedule and they wonder why everybody's not ahead of schedule in this society. It's all about, you know, uh, just, just being first and this, this instant gratification. We're still talking about four to five games for a rookie quarterback in the NFL on not the best team. They're, they're pretty okay for someone who was picking first overall. It's, it's a relatively good situation considering that, but it's still a month into a, a rookie's career. So just because he didn't, you know, blow the doors off of the league and is doing something unique like Jaden Daniels is doesn't mean there was ever anything wrong with Caleb Williams. We expected him to struggle some at, at some points when it comes to the speed of the game and learning what he can and cannot do when it comes to things that he got away with in college. So this is just, again, kind of like a nice, natural progression for Caleb Williams, if you will, starting to find his footing and, uh, you know, just improve as, as he typically would in in the NFL. So I think he's right on schedule and it's encouraging. You've seen what he can do and now you just ride the wave of progression. That's right. And for everybody out there, right? Um I, I made a tweet on the All 22 account showing how each year of the past three years there's been a quarterback that's come back from you know the, the depths of hell and become a pretty competent player like Geno Smith, uh Baker Mayfield, Sam Darnold, uh this year also uh Justin Fields. Those guys were all 
very high draft picks, right? Like they, they all have um, probably a first round pedigree. I think Geno Smith was early second round, but everybody also has a guy in the back of their mind that they're saying, man, this is the guy that I've always rooted for and I want to see succeed. And for a lot of you out there, that's probably Gardner Minshew, Gardner Minshew. Uh, this week, 55.3 grade got benched for Aiden O'Connell and they've confirmed that that benching is now permanent and that they're switching to Aiden O'Connell for you know the near future. I think what this can tell you as my most concerning uh, quarterback is really just the Raiders locker room at quarterback. If you were buying into one of those guys, I think at this point it's time to fail fast on that experiment and just be prepared that they will almost undoubtedly be picking a quarterback in the first round of the NFL draft this offseason. Even even with the class of quarterbacks really not being that phenomenal, expect the Raiders to be picking one. Yeah, Shadur Sanders in Las Vegas with Antonio Pierce. What could possibly go wrong there? Um, I mean, a nominee for most concerning, you could call the highest if you want, but Derek Carr went out with an oblique injury. Obviously, the last two weeks weren't as good as his first two games and, and the start that they had over there in New Orleans. So is it most concerning? No, but is it concerning? Yeah, we uh, he might miss time. And if he doesn't, he's now behind a battered offensive line. He's already injured. So what does that look like for the next month and a half uh, or perhaps the remainder of the season? Have we already seen the best of Derek Carr in 2024? And yet we're sitting here on uh, Tuesday, October 8th. I think that's a, a very distinct possibility. I'll also say I'm encouraged by the fact that, well, no, I'm not encouraged. I, I guess I'm neutral on the news though. Aaron Rodgers, we're not, we're not changing anything there. Head coach fired, but he probably wanted that. And that's the reason why his head coach is fired. But Hackett is still in the building. Who's the actual problem anyway? So I guess it actually doesn't change anything for Aaron Rodgers. I was really trying to hold my breath on that because we need this to be a semi-quick episode. But uh, yeah, Nathaniel Hackett might be, he might be the worst offensive coordinator in football and has proved that he is totally untrustworthy and unreliable. Uh, The fact that he is taking this Jets, Jets offense with the revamped offensive line the the addition of some weapons there right and and obviously a healthy rogers basically basically making it look the same as it looked with no offensive line no weapons no aaron Rodgers last year right like it's almost unbelievable that this is happening and to place that blame on the defensive minded head coach when the defense was having a top five defense you know week over week is is pretty mind-blowing uh but but I'm fine with the firing of Salah as long as you take everybody else out with them, like Hackett. Uh, keeping Hackett to me is just it, – it makes absolutely no sense. You know, I like that they made the the uh, interim head coach, the defensive coordinator. I think that's the right move because there's a chance they want to keep him around, right? That defense does look good. And I think by giving him this interim title, you know, when you do hire the next head coach, maybe he decides to stay because he knows that he is the, you know, the next guy up, the, the most trusted advisor on that team. So I like that, but if Hackett's still there, just yeah, I think I think that's the most concerning thing for anyone on the Jets offense. Yeah, every every head coach has an expiration date, and it's not it's not to say that things weren't headed in this direction eventually. But when you as an organization capitulate to one player, and by capitulating to that one player, you keep a massive problem on your staff, and then you hold the defensive minded head coach accountable for that and you just continue on getting paid and keeping your job for the rest of the season, that's where I have a problem. So again, you have a defensive-minded head coach, and by DVOA in 2022, you had the 29th uh, best offense and the 6th best defense. 2023, you had the offensive ranks in dead last, 32 overall, and the number 3 defense overall. And then so far in 2024, 23rd offense, 12th on defense. So again, he's giving you a top 12 defense every single year, and two of those years, top 6 and you fire the defensive head coach, you keep Nathaniel Hackett because, again, you just want to keep Aaron Rodgers happy and comfortable when you grow in the discomfort, and this is why the Jets are not playing to their potential because they're making the focal point of their entire franchise comfortable by keeping around an obvious weak point on the staff. Everybody out there, when you see me talking and Ray looking away, it's because he has a a thesaurus and a dictionary next to him, and he's pulling out words like, "What was that?" Capitulate. Capitulate. (laughs) Okay, great. Yeah, I think that I think I used that correctly. I have no idea. I was actually just looking up the DVOA ranks. So that was pretty good. uh, It was good. Yeah, that's that's what I was looking. Nobody knows, so nobody's gonna be able to challenge you on it. Uh, Let's go to running backs and look at the season leader, which is Derek Henry with a ninety point three. He's absolutely an ageless wonder at this point. We knew that him on the Ravens was going to be special, but maybe didn't understand how special and it's looking to be pretty insane 
top performer of the week, Jalen Jalen Wright uh, in Miami, 85.5 grade. Devin A. Chain uh, went down with an injury, and uh, Wright stepped up and looked great. So that's very exciting for Wright owners. Uh, Tank Bigsby, 81.0, as the most promising player. There are trade rumors about Travis Etienne uh, potentially being moved out of there if they keep losing games, and Tank Bigsby looks like he's ready to assume that role. Most concerning to me at the running back position, Brian Robinson Jr. with a 54.9. But it's not really the grade that's most concerning because Robinson has been pretty, you know, performing pretty well throughout the year. He's getting goal line carries, but this isn't traditional fantasy, right? And when I looked at the snap share in this game with Austin Eckler back, it leaned very heavily towards Eckler. So if Robinson Jr. is going to be losing a bit of his role, while in traditional fantasy, you might get those touchdowns here in all 22, you better hope that he's performing extremely well on those carries because there's a chance that, again, he's not even going to meet that snap count minimum. Yeah, and uh, it's 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 concerning only in that sense. I do think he is a quality player if he gets the, the proper snap share and has a big enough role or a large enough role. We did tell you all about Tank Bigsby back. This is probably going over a year ago now because he never, he just, we kind of, liked the player and then he just never really got an opportunity he might have been dinged up a little bit too here and there but um yeah I, I i'm not surprised at what's going on in jacksonville just be mindful of the snap share over there in washington because i do think like you echoed um robinson's a quality player but gotta have a big enough role or else it doesn't matter i didn't love bigsby to be perfectly frank i know you did but uh you know i think you should have just taken the credit with me i would no, I nobody would have remembered i can't do that <laughs> You know, I think that the size concerns me just from a, like, is he going to be in every snap uh, back? But I, I really did like Jalen Wright. So I am very encouraged by what could be there in Miami if uh, if other guys are going to be injured. But let's go to wide receiver where Nico Collins is still the season leader with a 92.1. He was also the top performer of the week with a 94.6, but he left the game with an injury and may be missing time. So definitely a situation to watch there. I think that there's a possibility that other guys now step up in that offense. Should we be seeing, you know, Stefan Diggs getting just more looks and more opportunity? Uh, Tank Dell, if he can stay healthy, just kind of start to shine a little bit more. Promising, I think there are two guys here. I only have the numbers on one of them, but T. Higgins with an 81.7. Uh, you know, that's encouraging because, you know, again, coming, coming off of the injury at the beginning of the season, worried about his contract. Uh, came up a little bit slow. We, you know, the first game he played last week, he played a little bit better. And then this week topping 80, that's, that's very promising. But the other guy I wanted to talk about just really quickly goes with my most concerning. My most concerning is Michael Pittman with a 55.4, but the other promising guy is Josh Downs, who has looked fantastic for that Colts offense. It's pretty interesting to me. And I was curious if you have any thoughts on this, you know, why the, uh, the, the, the tide is shifting more in favor of Downs than Pittman and why Pittman has looked kind of just not up to par at this point this year when he was the presumed number one in that offense. Because Josh Downs is just a flat-out good football player and kind of always has been. Um, he's not a prototype. He's 5'9", like 170 pounds. He's a slot receiver uh, who I think was also nicked up a little bit, missed a couple of games last year. So that's something else to consider. But, yeah, he gets a lot of separation and also gains a lot of ground downfield for a smaller player where even if you're a small shifty guy, you're not necessarily a deep threat. Josh Downs is a three-level threat from the slot, and I think when you get a quarterback like Joe Flacco in there uh, as opposed to Anthony Richardson, who's more of a see-it-than-throw-it type of guy, uh, I, I think that lends itself a bit more to uh, Josh Downs' game uh, when he can gain that separation and then be rewarded for it in stride. Uh, now, there's going to be some back and forth. Apparently it's Richardson's job when he's healthy again and comes back whenever that is. So I'm not sure I fully trust it anyway, even though I think Josh Downs himself is a phenomenal wide receiver and Pittman just gets the attention because he looks like a phenomenal wide receiver and he's good in his own right. But just because Josh Downs isn't a prototype doesn't mean he's not the most dangerous player uh, in that passing attack because to me, I've kind of always felt he is. He's he's a very dangerous type of receiver at all three levels. We just haven't really seen the best of him yet, and maybe the style of this new quarterback helps for however long it lasts. Okay, Ray, moving to tight end. I just want to say I'm never wrong. I'm just oh, gosh, early, go. don't, right? I don't even, I know, I don't even is... know who this is about, but I just can't wait to hear Brock Bowers is the season leader at tight end with an 82.7. And you while, act like you went on a limb. That's not a limb. I 
was down on Brock Bowers. And I'm saying that yes. while he is performing extremely well this year. Okay, let's go. Year one tight ends sometimes do work out and play really well uh, and have these big outbursts early in their careers. But once year two starts and the defenses start to figure them out, that's when we see them kind of come back to earth. And, you know, you can quote this, uh, this stat as much as you want. Tight ends that have a thousand yards as rookies have never had a thousand yards in year two, I think in year three as well. So I'm not surprised by what Brock Bowers is doing. I am excited for him. I think he's doing an incredible job. Looks great as a receiver, but just temper what we are expecting here. I had a conversation with a buddy of mine last year who had Sam Laporta shares, who was saying, you know, that he was going to hold on to him and that he was untradeable. I said, this is the perfect time to trade Sam Laporta. Go get your two first round picks for the crazy person that's willing to trade for him. I would say the same thing to you if you're a Brock Bowers owner. Go get as much as you can because while it is promising what you're seeing, just remember that tight ends typically take five to six years to truly develop in, into an all-around player. We also don't know who's going to be throwing the ball next year. So while it's promising, right, I'm, not, I'm trying not to be that POS hater on Brock Bowers, but just temper your expectations on Brock Bowers. But shout out to him, 82.7 being the season leader. Top performer of the week is Charlie Kohler with a 95.7. Most promising, Brock Bowers, I'll say it again. Uh, his season was the 82.7, but on the week it was a 75.7. Most concerning to me, Dalton Schultz with a 56.2. And I looked at his uh, week over week, and it's been extremely poor. He was kind of this perfect fit there in Houston. Uh, thought that he would absolutely just have a tremendous start there. And it hasn't really been going that way, at least in this year or two in that Houston offense. Maybe there's an opportunity for him now with Nico Collins uh, missing time as they might need a bigger body guy to become more of a deep threat. Uh, but I am definitely concerned about Dalton Schultz uh, early in the season. I'm still just trying to gather myself from the Brock Bowers thing because, I mean, he's got he's got Gardner Minshew and Aiden O'Connell throwing in the ball. So, like, you could adjust to whatever you want next year if he's got just a, a, a semi-competent, just warm-blooded humanoid back there throwing in the football next year. That That's great. It's still even better for him, I think. Uh, but... Uh, Dalton Schultz, he's been, he was never someone who created for himself. He was, he's always been in tight end friendly situations, uh, whether it was in Dallas where Dak is incredible at that seam ball in particular to tight ends. And they had wide receivers with Amari Cooper and CD lamb and, and Michael Gallup at, in his heyday at the time, kind of opening things up. And then he goes to Houston where again, they have a bevy of weapons and a great quarterback and CJ Stroud, uh, and a great play caller again, just allowing him to just take advantage of the attention that's just gone everywhere else. And that just hasn't been the case this year. And the situation is still good. So I don't know. It could be a, a slump even when you take that into consideration. But with Nico Collins now probably out for a few weeks, that sledding doesn't get any easier for Dalton Schultz. And while he might get more targets as a result of that, he, again, isn't someone who kind of creates for himself. He's not a mismatch. He's not the guy that's going to shake you at the top of his route and get open on a corner, uh, you know, on a corner route, you know, 20 yards downfield and make something happen for a chunk explosive play. That's not his game. So I think losing a weapon like Nico Collins actually just kind of makes things a bit more crowded overall for, for Schultz. And while I think Bobby Slowick will be able to scheme around that and still manufacture offense well, I don't think it makes things any better for Dalton Schultz. So there might be some natural progression back to the mean, but I don't think the loss of Collins is an opportunity for Schultz to sort of elevate his game beyond what we've seen the last few years anyway. Awesome. Well, we are we are definitely uh, taking way too much time talking about some of these positions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through the next two positions and you're going to stop me when you want to talk about somebody. But Tackle is Taron Armstead leading the season with a 90.4. He was also the top performer of the week with a 91.3 against the Patriots. Keon White had the worst game of his early career going against Armstead. So that's something to watch. Uh, if he can stay healthy, Armstead is obviously a huge piece of that Miami offense. Promising is Bernard Raymond, 82.1 grade. We talked about him in the offseason being a tackle to watch as he has really had this like super quiet start to his career, but he's been great every step of the way. And then the most concerning on the opposite side, I think the same draft is Trevor Penning, 56.6. And he is a big reason why that uh, New Orleans offensive line has been poor. Let's go quickly to guard 
season leader, James Daniels, still 92.9. Top performer of the week, though, is Ezra Cleveland with a 90.7. Promising game from Elijah Vera Tucker with an 88.4. We know the Jets are going to need that. And then the most concerning is Matthew Bergeron with a 52.1. That's the one I thought maybe you'd want to talk about because I know that you liked him a lot. I, I, I liked the landing spot. I liked the possibilities of Matthew Bergeron, but I didn't have him that high up in my rankings uh, during that draft year. And I think I'm starting to see why, right? Like there is definitely some flaws to his game, definitely some technique issues. Curious what you think. Yeah, he's he's always been decently athletic or probably better than decently athletic, I would say, uh, with a good frame. So the, the chief struggle for him thus far is really his run blocking. Uh, we thought that might improve and it still may with time is his second year in the league. Right. And so, you know, maybe it just takes some time to develop that grown man strength, if you will, and kind of develop that part of his game. Um, but the pass blocking grade is still just about average, which is okay. If you're also a, a, an, an average or slightly above average run blocker, then you could just find yourself as a steady option at guard. But that, that just run block strength has not developed the way we have hoped. It's still early. So I'm not panicking. You could say most concerning. I think it's it's relatively fair because I, I would ex have expected him to be further along than he is. But I'm certainly not panicking. And again, there's not that many great guards out there anyway, so I'm still holding on for the upside. But I'm probably keeping him away from my starting lineup now. Whereas, you know, for a few shares that I do have of him early on in this year, he might have been my you know guard two uh, with some upside hopes there week to week. I think now I'm just kind of shifting him back down until I see that that growth in his game, and it might not come till maybe even next year now that we're already a third of the way through the season already. So uh, slightly disappointing, but long-term, I'm not terribly concerned just yet. It's just probably going to take a bit more time than we had hoped. Awesome. Okay. Center position, Creed Humphrey is the season leader with a 93.7. He was also the top performer of the week with an 81.8. No surprise there. Zach Frazier, he's back as my most promising center, 70.8. He's been fantastic and exactly what the Steelers needed. Most concerning to me still Josh Myers, 40.6 grade. I really am just waiting for the day where they say, okay, um, Monk from Duke, time for you to step in there and try it out, try it out at center. Because at this point, I think Josh Myers is proving he's not the guy in Green Bay at center. Let's move to the defensive side of the ball. Defensive interior, the season leader is still Cam Hayward with a 90.7, but the top performer of the week is another vet, Chris Jones with a 93.2. I wanted to call out the next guy. Kobe Turner was the promising performance with a 90.4 after that really rough start to the beginning of the year with three games, I think in the 50s and lower. He's actually come back with an 80 grade and a 90.4. So very excited to see Kobe Turner starting to turn it around. And then I'll give you your moment to talk about Mozzie Smith, 40.6 grade. That is the most concerning. I know you were concerned in the offseason, so I thought you might have some something to say about it. Yeah, he's just very up and down. And um, I mean, he was across from a promising uh, center over there in in Zach Frazier. So uh, one more feather in the cap of, of Zach Frazier is, yes, obviously performed very well uh, against another or, or not another, but a, a first round pick the previous year in, in Mozzie Smith, who's been up and down. Mozzie had a phenomenal game against the Giants, but it was the Giants. Now he's going up against a quality interior offensive lineman and again, or offensive line as a whole, and again, just doesn't really perform up to par. He did not have a good game at all uh, against the Steelers. The other thing to note for Frazier is just imagine how good he's going to perform when the opponent has to actually respect the passing game and not just have everything so congested in the front there by the line of scrimmage because uh, just watching that game on Sunday night, Monday morning, uh, you could see that defense had no respect for the deep ball at all, and Justin Fields made, did not make them pay for it hardly ever. So um, that just made life tough for the offensive line, and for a young player like Zach Frazier to still perform that well is incredibly encouraging. And for Mozzie Smith, it's just another just – you know, just another saga in the roller coaster of Mozzie Smith. The the Cowboys badly mismanaged him his rookie year. Then he was injured all offseason. Now he's coming back. You're going to see some ups, but you're going to see way more downs. So while he performed well against the Giants and showed you what he could be, he is not anywhere close to the player he could be at a consistent level. And he should not be a starter. And he's a he's a firm stash. Even through these bye weeks, you should not be starting him. Uh, so step away from those three, four uh, formations. Just keep him as a long-term stash. See, again, what he could do with a fully healthy offseason if he's afforded that this coming offseason. 
and can be the player that he was always meant to be, which is a 320 plus pounder who's a run stopper first with some uh, pop as a pass rusher occasionally. But uh, that's just not what we've seen to date. No, it isn't. He's a guy I loved in college, so I, I do want to see that rebound. Uh, let's go to edge position. Aiden Hutchinson gets to sit on you know, a bye week with a 93.8 season grade and, and continue to be the season leader. Top performer is Miles Garrett with an 89.5. No surprise there. Uh, but the promising, Nick Herbig gets injured, but 82.5 grade in that game. He's really showing that he is a force there in, uh, in Pittsburgh. Most concerning... Montez Sweat, yet again, 56.2. I think at this point it's – it's uh, what's the word about a dead horse? I don't want to beat it, but, uh, you know, it's not it's not the nice thing to say. That. I know. Okay. So I think I'm done. This will be the last week I call out Montez Sweat. Linebacker, season leader is Fred Warner with a 94.1. We're going to keep seeing that. Top performer, though, Jeremiah Owusu-Koromoa, 91.1. And the promising is your boy, Edgerin Cooper, 86.6 grade. Uh, tell me what you loved about him and what are you seeing translate? Yeah, the best thing about Edron Cooper was his ability to, once he sees it, he just goes. His trigger downhill is just so incredible. He's very explosive downhill. And, uh, I mean, you saw that really against Alabama even uh, back in college when he would trigger against Jalen Milrow and just stop him dead in his tracks. Um, it's almost similar to, I'm going to throw out a name that's now the fact that they're probably the same age and a comparison is just crazy uh, to DeMarvi and Overshone in, in that same way where once you see it and they go and trigger that closing speed and pursuit is, is top notch. Cooper's not quite there at that level, right? He's not quite that. And he is still inconsistent given he's a rookie linebacker. You're going to see some ups and downs here. Um, but he's got that explosiveness. He's He had a great uh, performance as a pass rusher and then also just kind of steady in coverage and run defense. So with a larger role, I expect some bumps in the road and some hiccups. But the physical ability is all there. He also did not have a full offseason. I believe he missed some time in training camp too. So again, he, this is someone who's kind of just going out there on raw ability right now and still performing at a level that shows he belongs, but he's a linebacker and he's a rookie. So this isn't like a, an endorsement for an every week start or anything like that, or maybe an any week start until we see it a bit more often, but uh, it's a very encouraging sign and you should be glad you drafted him in the, if you did, which I think uh, a standard ADP for him was around the fifth round in rookie drafts, for example. So um, again, not, you didn't pay a terribly high price to get him, and that can yield some big returns. Absolutely can. Okay, the most concerning at linebacker for me, Caden Ellis, 48.5. Uh, let's go to cornerback, where the season leader is now DJ Reed with a 90.5. So I've been watching a lot of DJ Reed, and I'll turn on the game for five minutes and see him bat two passes in that time. It's It's been an incredible season for him, and I love to see it because he's a hardworking player and often gets overshadowed, right, because he's with Sauce Gardner there. Top performer of the week, though, Deontay Banks uh, for the Giants, 89.9. I did get to watch some of his highlights as well, going against DK Metcalf and doing an absolutely phenomenal job. Promising, Riley Snow Leopard Moss with an 84 grade on the week. Uh, absolutely having a great uh, little run here for him. Love to see it across from Patrick Sertain. And then the most concerning, and I wanted to see what you had to say about this because I know this is one of your boys as well, but Trevarius Ward with a 36.9. I think he might be dealing with some injuries. And on last episode, we talked about at the corner position, if you have that P under the mattress, right? If you have a tiny nagging injury, it might be exacerbated when you're on the field at cornerback because even the smallest hitch in your step, right, can create such separation with the receiver. Is that what's happening here? I think so. And he's a big corner. And so he was never like the fleetest of foot. He was he was athletic and big and can cover ground, but he wasn't necessarily just stick in your hip pocket and you cut three times and still don't gain separation from him and can't shake him. That was never really his game. Uh, it was more so using that size and athleticism to his advantage. So if he's sapped of any of that athleticism, beyond again not being that top tier level type of athlete or you know light of foot player anyway that's going to really hold him down so I, I think that's what this is uh i mean the the san francisco defense as a whole didn't have a great day either so i think it's just a compounding effect here but uh, yeah that that injury status is something to monitor because like you said I, I don't know what you said about the p under the bed or whatever that was but um yeah it's it it's important just because he's available doesn't mean he's a hundred percent and if he's not a hundred percent 
you have to consider your other options at a position as valuable at cornerback because you can't afford to just have that whiff that you know 40-ish grade or whatever he had this past week because that that can sink you that's a two and a half point swing give or take from a quality start from someone at that position which is all it takes to lose a game in all 22 for the week so um yeah monitor that you know maybe look at your other options until you do see a clean bill of health or some improvement on the performance side for ward because uh yeah that's a concerning one and you can't afford to have him in your lineup to wait to see when he does become healthy, fully healthy enough to play to the form that we know he's capable of. Okay. Last but not least, the safety position where Xavier McKinney is now the season leader with a 90.8. The top performer is Dadrian Taylor Demerson with a 91.9. And then the most promising is Nick Cross with a 79.8. He is rising up the ranks. And then again, this will be the last week I do this, I promise, but Jaquan Brisker, 48.5. I don't even think that's real. I'm going to have to check on that just to be sure you're not just making up numbers at this point for Jaquan Brisker. But um, yeah, it's real, but I, I still don't believe you. I think you put that in the platform. Um, I am not, I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to sell Jaquan Brisker. So it just is what it is. Uh, did actually, um, uh, again, so he's got a concussion issue going on there. So who knows? Maybe his brain was just foggy. I don't know. I'm going to keep making excuses for him. But overall, I think what we are seeing, though, is that Xavier McKinney was a phenomenal pickup uh, this past offseason as well. And again, we're talking about slim pickings at safety. Well, the Packers got a good one, and uh, he's he's making the most of his time there. He's making game-changing plays and still just being consistent overall. The number one graded uh, cover safety in the league right now, uh, still you know just around a 70-ish on run defense as well. So he's well-rounded, but making game-changing plays as well. That's exactly what you want to see. He's setting a floor for himself and then brushing up against that ceiling week in and week out. Also, just 26 years old, in his prime, he checks every single box for a safety. So slam dunk, grand slam, home run, whatever you want to call it, Xavier McKinney is it at the safety position. How about a touchdown? Yeah, Xavier McKinney, uh, you know, again, the, the, the Packers don't spend money. So when they do, take note of it, right? And Xavier McKinney is a guy they decided was worth doing that. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. If you haven't yet, please give us a follow on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram. I don't know, you always say them out of TikTok. order, so I, I, don't know, know. I, don't, I don't know what you said. Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, I'm missing one. Twitter. Twitter, follow X. us on all of them all 22 underscore PFF, and then give us a review wherever you watch or listen to your podcasts. Have a great day. I'm a ghost.